So there are two types of people in this world. There are those that love to plan. Uh, man, they have a calendar, color coordinated, their vacation where they're like, I just need rest and to get away from everything they have organized and planned out to the T. And then there's other people that don't like to plan. They like to just live in the moment. They have no plan. They don't even know how to open their calendar. Like that's, and usually those two people are married to each other. But here's the thing. We can all agree, no matter if you like planning or you don't, that uh, when someone makes a plan, they do it with a purpose in mind. They have a reason for their planning. They, they want to accomplish something. They have a purpose. But the, the struggle is when it comes to a plan and to a purpose and to a goal that you want to achieve, often it, it really matters is timing is essential. Timing is everything. Like, like the career that you desire to get to, uh, you're, you're, you might not be ready for it yet because you have experience and education to get. Timing's important. If you, you're looking for that promotion, you got to prove yourself and prove you're qualified before you ever get to that place. And even in relationships, uh, in marriage, you could probably say today, if you have a thriving marriage, you've had to work for it and all that stuff. But if you were to meet before the time you did, it might not have been the right time. I know for me, if my wife met me earlier in time, she would have ran for the hills because I needed time to mature before we met. Timing matters. Timing is maturing. Even in our society, we recognize this globally, like the Supreme Court in 2005 even came down with a verdict to abolish uh, juvenile death penalty. Why? Because psychologists and others could prove that, that younger people needed more maturity. They didn't properly even understand some of the actions they took that mattered so essentially. So they determined certain actions from that. Time is important. It's maturing that happens in that. Part of my question today is just like, what does real maturity look like for you? Like, what does that really look like, especially when it comes to like your spiritual maturity? Before we dive in, would you just, uh, let me just read this uh, at John chapter 17, verse 1. And it says this, after saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Would you join me in prayer right now? Heavenly Father, God, I pray today would maybe be a moment for us that you would open our eyes, that we would be revealed to something so essential in our own lives. What does maturity and growth look like? God, I pray today, I pray in this moment that you would open our eyes and reveal this to us, that we'd walk out of here just with a, a better perspective of what you're doing. God, we give you all the glory and all the praise. It's in Jesus' name we say, amen. So today I wanna look at uh, this section of scripture and really John chapter 17 is the beginning of a prayer that Jesus gives and scholars believe this is the prayer that he is in the garden of Gethsemane it's right before he's about to be arrested and executed for preaching the gospel for sharing of this news and, and he's here and he begins to pray to God the father and he has these three kind of points in his prayer that I think are so important for us it, it, first one is just found in verse one and it just says this, it says, after saying all these things, which for us can just be clearly connected and we can discover this, like what he's speaking about is he is speaking to uh, what he was just teaching about in John chapter 15 and 16. He's teaching the disciples, he's preparing them. He's warning them, like you gotta make sure you're ready because things are gonna come and you gotta be prepared for the season ahead because he knows what's about to happen where he will give his life but for the greatest reward ever. So he says, after saying all these things, now he begins a new conversation, a personal prayer. And it says this, Father, the hour has come. And it's, it's interesting because this is not even new for them. 
Like they would have heard Jesus actually refer to this throughout the gospel. John chapter 2, Jesus tells his mother who wants him to do a couple actions to try to help a little party get better. And he says, my time has not come yet. In John chapter 7, his brothers are like, man, all these people are talking trash about you, all this stuff, and, and, and we like, just perform a miracle. Do something. Prove to them you are who you say you are. And he says, my time is not yet. In John chapter 8, Jesus again, he, it, it, we're told he's teaching in the synagogue, in the temple, and the religious people do what the religious people do, which is get angry at other people. And, uh, and, and they, they want to arrest him, but somehow it says God protected him in that moment because his time has not come yet. So many times we see when his time hasn't come. But here in John chapter 17, all of a sudden Jesus says, the hour has come. And for many of us, I just want to say, like, sometimes timing is the most difficult thing in our spiritual journey. Like, timing sucks. Let's be honest. We don't want to wait. Like, things don't happen when we want. Like, we, we struggle with timing. But sometimes we need to discover this, that when the time is right, it's right. But when it's wrong, maybe God is saying, I want to do something in you in this preparation season. Like, th this is so important that we discover because uh, uh, the better career that you desire, maybe you just need to look like logistically, like the season you're in, you, you don't have the better career because there's other things you need to be prepared for. You need to get the experience. You need to get the understanding, the education, whatever it might be. You, you want stability. So you want financial stability, money, right? That brings always better happiness, right? That always fixes every problem. But maybe you need to discover that, hey, maybe with the money you do have, you need to learn how to be more wise and frugal with what you got. Because I know a lot of people that make a lot of money, but they spend all that same money and they live paycheck to paycheck. Maybe God wants you to live a better life. Maybe even in your marriage where you're like, I just want it better. And maybe you need to see, no, in the season you're in, it's hard. Every marriage you have to work at, you need to continue to fight for. But it's that foundation that you have to build before you can build the house. Like, that's essential. Timing matters. I've shared this before, but in my own life, like one of the most uh, real moments of me seeing God at work uh, a few years ago when I lived in Florida, and I was already knowing, like I felt it on my heart that there was a new season ahead of ministry that I just desired, but I wasn't yet in. And I, I had to wait. And, and it was in that season where I'm reading through the book of Acts, which I, that's probably my favorite book of the Bible, maybe because of this moment in my life. And, and actually, that's the next book next year, which we're going to go chapter by chapter through. But it's in Acts where towards the end, we see Paul is sharing the gospel. He gets arrested and persecuted. He's arrested and in a prison cell. God tells him, I'm going to send you to Rome and you're going to preach the gospel there. What excitement. He's sitting in a prison cell, but he's already promised Rome. But then later in that chapter, at the very end, it finishes with this. It says, but Paul remained where he was for two more years. And that struck me because I was where I was at and I felt like God was calling me to that next phase. But what if I need to be okay with where I'm at for the next two years? And in those next two years for me, God God showed me that maybe my next step is, hey, go get your master's in theology. God uh, showed me more time and quality time with my family to really care for them. God showed me, hey, you need to actually know me and build a relationship deeper with me before you can go do anything else. And what if those two years are essential for you to get to the place that you want to be? Like timing is important, but sometimes we only want to see the timing come when we get to the place we want to be. But the, the time you're in now is so essential for the maturity of where you'll be. Timing is important. And Jesus, he says it over and over again. The time has not come as he's still doing ministry and, and being persecuted and hated on and judged and all this stuff. But then he finally gets to the place and he says, the time has come. And he begins this prayer with God. And he, he, he shows us in verse 4 as he's praying. And he says this, I brought glory to you here on earth. And he says, by completing the work you gave me to do. And, and now he's connecting it to what he's about to do. We all have this information. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He went to the cross to bring about grace and salvation upon our lives. We know this information. This is what the work that will be completed is going to be done. This is what he's directing to. He had a purpose. He came with a plan for each of us. And even than that, what I want you to hear is 
what he says throughout this, his first point in his prayer is that Jesus prays that he himself would bring glory to God, that the actions and the work that he will do will bring glory to God. And the same prayer is the one that we have to be living, that your life would bring glory to God, that you actually do have a purpose. For some of us, we live our life just Monday through Friday, try to survive, right? And hopefully you get a decent retirement and you can just exist. And your life comes to an end and you did it, I guess. Like, that's it. But what if you recognize that there is a purpose that you have that God has given you in your personal life? That God has placed a purpose in you that I can't fulfill and no one else can. And it's all to bring glory to God. What if there was a purpose what if there was a purpose for each of us that is more than just existing and just trying to be a good person? Like, What if there was more? And, and Jesus, he's praying this out for himself, that his purpose would bring glory to God for each of us. But then Jesus, he, he starts to shift the prayer and he begins to pray for his followers, for the disciples. But he even says later in the chapter, he says, for the disciples now, but also those in the future. He's speaking about you. He's praying for you in this moment as well. And he, he prays this and he says, in verse 3 he says, and this is the way to have eternal life. This is what it's all about. And he says, to know, to know you, the one true God. Like th this is important. Like hopefully we don't miss this, how essential this is. He says, uh, this is what matters, to know you, to know the one true God. And this word know, it's, it's interesting because for us, we use the word know all the time. Like I have knowledge of something. Like I know information. But the word know that, that actually is being said here is uh, this word right here. It's, that's the original word, yonosko. And, and the word actually, it's, it's to have a knowledge of, but it's, it's not in the way that sometimes we use the word knowledge. It's, it's more of a personal information. So when he says it, it's, it's not, hey, that you would know of God, that you like have book smarts, right? The religious people, the Pharisees, they had that. That's not what he's speaking about. What he's speaking about is a know that is essential. It's a personal relationship. It's to know someone intimately. This is what he's speaking of. He's saying, man, that they would each know you, that they would know who you are. And this begins from the inside. And this is, this is what I, I, I want to speak to for just a moment. And, and I hope that you can just hear this and just authentically, like, look within yourself and, and just think this through. Like, do you truly know God on a personal level? Like, are, are you continuously seeking that out? Not just, I, I hope to know more of God's word, which is good. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. But to know God on a personal level. Because that's what Jesus prays for. And later he'll say like that they know the truth and that truth will then set them free, show them how to live, all that stuff. But, but the most essential thing that he's pointing out is that you know God on a personal level. That this is how you withstand storms. That your spiritual maturity matters. Your spiritual maturity matters. Like it's essential to your life. It's essential to the seasons ahead that you'll face. Like, you, you, you have to understand this. And, and in the ministry, like, we, we do so much to, for, for the good, right? We have good uh, desires. So in the church, right, we have different things. I've been in ministry long enough where we want to create a great atmosphere. Our band works very hard in our production team to create an atmosphere where we can come together and worship and, and hear the word. And hopefully something can connect with us. And we create a great kids environment. We have coffee and hangout area and all that stuff. And that's all good. But here at the end of the point, like that stuff can't be the reason why you're here. And the problem is often you keep people with how you attract them. So if you only came because maybe the music was interesting or this or that, like, like whatever it might be, like if that's all you're here, the, the problem becomes like where are you at in your personal walk? What does your, your relationship look like with God when, when you're not in this room? On Tuesday, just you and God, what does your worship look like? your relationship look like? Because that's the thing that can help you and sustain you. We can't. Whether we have coffee here or I stand up here and speak cannot sustain you for the seasons ahead. 
Your spiritual maturity, it matters. It's essential. You know, and my, my struggle is for me, even this week, it just hit me like a ton of bricks, is for me, I, I can focus so much on the church, but in that, miss Christ. I, I can focus on the ministry, but I miss the man that actually matters. And, and all this stuff, you just have to wipe away and say, like, what do I do actually with God? Who is he? And then what does that mean for me and his, my relationship with him? Because this is essential. And, and we look at this, and I just want to, like, ask this question. If, if you were to just, like, logistically, if we just stop for a moment and say, like, if you look at your life, and your life doesn't look any different than years ago, than before you ever heard of Jesus, if your life doesn't really look any different, like, has God actually changed you? And I, I know that's a tough question, maybe. And as you do that, can someone, if you have a Bible right now, just open up to 1 John 3.10. 1 John 3.10, it's like right next to Revelation. So at the very end, 1 John 3.10, whoever gets there, just raise your hand first. But the, the question that I ask is like, logistically, if your life doesn't look any different, day in, day out, year in, year out, decade in, decade out, has God actually done anything in your life? And that's a tough question. You got it? You, got it? you have it? Can I, can I have it? Can I have your Bible? I'm just going to steal it right now. Thank you. Ooh, it's highlighted. <laughs> nice. Where are we at? 310. Okay, here it is. What translation is this? Ooh, that's holier than me. New King James. All right. It says this, 310. It says, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Let me read that again. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So you can, you can hear that right now. You, and and Maybe the question you have, and you're going, what are you saying here, Scott? Are you saying if I, if I don't love my brother, if I don't love my sister, if I, I, I have someone that I hate in my life, that I'm holding this grudge against this, like, are you saying that I'm a child of the devil, that, that I am not of God because of that? And no, I would never say that. But the Bible does. What do we do with that? Like, and I'm being completely honest. Like, what do you do with that tension when you read that? Like, what it says is if you don't start to change, have a transformation in your life, and that doesn't change into us caring and loving for our brothers and our sisters. Like, it's saying that it's not having an effect. If you're not letting the Holy Spirit work in your life, it's not changing anything about you, then what is actually occurring? Like, what do we do with that? And John, he explains, don't be deceived by other people, by other teachers. Jesus, he prays, and he, he prays this in verse 9. He says, my prayer is not for the world. And he doesn't mean that in a mean way because he's praying that, that the followers of Christ would survive and, and, and exist throughout the season ahead. And he says, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. My prayer is for you. He's speaking about you have accepted Christ. He's praying for you. He's saying that you would actually experience something that would change your life. That there's something essential about what happens on the inside of us. And I want you to hear that. When you read that text, if you think, okay, I gotta, I gotta act a little better. I, I gotta be nice to some people. You're thinking about it on the external. And the thing that Jesus is praying about, the inside. It's gotta happen here. It's gotta change you on the inside first. This is what he's speaking about. He's praying for each of us. And he's saying, man, that they would survive in the season ahead because there's going to be difficulty. There's going to be struggles. Like all this stuff which all of us have experienced in our life. And Jesus prays for you in this moment. And he's praying that you would survive in the season ahead. And the only way you can is not because you sit here and hear my words. And you say, oh, I made it through a Sunday. I feel good now. I can survive for the next week. Or, or you're living off your parents. Whatever it is, like you have to have it happen here first. You have to let the work of God happen inside first, in your heart. See, there must be a change, and that begins on the inside. 
But Jesus then he changes his prayer in chapter 17 more and he starts to speak to another point. And Jesus begins to pray, not just that we as the followers survive, but that we thrive. He, he prays that, that something more would happen in our life. When I was a kid, I was learning how to swim and my, my father, uh, he took me and he threw me into the deep end, right? Some of you are like, that's a really bad father. And I agree. Uh, <laughs> He, he's not good. And uh, I can say that because he's in the room. And, uh, but there, there's something actually valuable about learning kind of in the moment, right? Like some of you maybe had a similar experience. When you have to learn in the moment, it really prepares you in a better way, right? If someone says, I went and got an education, we say that's really nice. But until you have experience, you're missing a key part, right? Like if they have experience, that really speaks to something. And my biggest concern within the church, and I don't mean just this church, I mean globally, especially the Western church, is this, that there are a lot of people floating around in their faith wearing life jackets. Right. What I mean is, you're wearing the life jacket of your parents' faith, the life jacket of this church, the life jacket of, uh, uh, of routines and traditions that you've carried along in your life, and those are the things that are trying to help keep your faith afloat. You're living off of maybe you listen on the radio or you hear the words that I say, and that's supposed to be the thing that helps you get through the seasons that you have to go through, the difficulties and the storms. And for some of us, you have to realize you have to take off the life jacket, and you got to actually see if you can swim. Because here's the thing. When it comes to a life jacket, you don't know if someone can swim until they take it off. And, and that's where it matters. Like your faith, your spiritual maturity, it's on you. I, I, can't, I can't make sure that you have that or you sustain that. But, but I can tell you, if, if you're not figuring that out on your own, and like the church is here and we're biblically the church is supposed to come alongside each other, but, but we have to have that happening on the inside first. If, if that's not happening, the storms will come and, and they could destroy you and, and rip apart your faith. And we see so many people where, they, where they're called deconversions, where they lose their faith. And I'm, I'm not condemning or anything, but it's because sometimes we don't have it inside of us enough to keep us afloat during the difficulties. You, you have to have it. You, you have to have that personal relationship. What Jesus says is that they know you, that they know you authentically on their own. So, so when we read chapter 17 and we see this out late, like, like my question becomes like, do we actually believe this? Because when Jesus, he has this prayer and he continues on and he prays that not only you'd survive, but that you would thrive. Do, do you actually believe that? Like, do you actually believe that, that when you read scripture, God, Jesus says that he is sending someone after him, the Holy Spirit, that is going to do even more in your life? Even more than he did is how he explains it. So Jesus stands beside an adulterer, and she's about to be executed for her crime in that time. And he stands beside her and defends her. Jesus heals a blind man and helps him see again. Jesus stands beside a bed where a man is dead and raises him to life. And then he says that you're going to be able to do those things and even more. Do you actually believe that? Do I actually believe that, that I'm not up here just saying some words and we go about our day and I just got to survive until next Sunday and hopefully I can do it again? And like, no, but do I actually believe that God would use a gift that he's given me to be able to speak and communicate, and that through that, he would use those words to do more than I could imagine, more than I could do on my own. Do I actually believe that? Do you actually believe that God could use you, the purpose you have, the gifts that you have that I don't have, that only you have, that you could stand beside someone in their distress and their struggle, that you could help someone start to see who Jesus Christ is and the purpose that they, he has given them as well, to help people realize from death of sin to life in Christ, they find it and discover it. Do you actually believe it? Like, do you actually believe that God could do that in your life? Because if you do, then you start to discover your purpose. Because your purpose, God has given you a gift, a desire within your heart. And it is not wrong. It could exist maybe in your workplace, in your home, in the church itself. That you could manifest that and it would change lives forever. Not because of you, but because of your willingness to let God work in you. Amen. But it happens here first. It has to happen on the inside. And I, I can't like... Uh, complain enough or say certain words to try to get you to do it, you have to do it yourself. You have to want it. Sometimes it starts with just us surrendering a little.
because the whole time we go through life like this, trying to control everything. Time, God, I want what I want when I want it. What if you had to wait two more years for that thing that's on your heart that you desire? Because God wants to work in you in a different way first. And maybe you just need to start to do this. What Jesus says is he says that we would love our brothers and sisters like Christ loved the church. And Christ gave his life for the church. For just a moment, like look to your left or look to your right. Make eye contact. You see someone that you don't really know? You see someone that you do know? Can I ask you this? Be honest. Do you love them like Christ loved you? Really? Do you even know the person? Like, that's the problem. Like, but Jesus, he says, like, we should love each other. Brothers and sisters, he even says it this way, that the way that we love and support each other actually proclaims and shows to everyone else around us who he is. Because the way we care. Can we just be real for a second? Look in our society today. Division, hate, all the time, all this stuff. Let's speak about my truth and I want to speak against you and why you're ruining everything. What if for a moment we said, no, I want to love people even when I disagree with them. What if we were like Jesus where he shows up at tax collectors and other people and he starts to love them and meet them where they're at and they would start to recognize from blind to eyesight. What if that was the case? What if that's how we lived? But none of that can happen, and I can't push you to do that. What you have to do is just be willing to let God work that out in you. It has to happen inside. You have to want it. And right now, I just want to encourage you, wherever you're at today, wherever you feel like you are with God, Maybe you feel like you know him and love him. Maybe you feel like your relationship with him is growing all the time. Or maybe you feel like you, you're not even sure about this God thing yet. Just for a moment. Like just for a moment, would you just stop and, and just really, that, that has to happen inside you. And I just want to ask you right now, wherever you're at, if you, just put your hands out like this. It's a sign of welcoming of something. One, it's, it's us no longer clenching our fists, trying to control everything. And two, it's, it's a sign of surrender, just saying, God, I, I don't have it. It's not of me. And right now, Heavenly Father, God, I just pray right now for each of us, God, for me, that it, it doesn't matter the next action or the next word I say, but God, that I just want you, that I care about who you are, that I know you, not just intellectually, but I know you on a personal level. God, I pray for each of us that we will not be a people that just go through the, the, the routine of life, just, just wanting to, to make us look the right way, but God, that we actually desire that it is all and only because of you and what you do that happens on the inside out. God, I pray today that you'd begin that work in us that we would see you even in a new light, that we would hunger for you. We've been following you for decades or for days, but either way, we know that there is still more to discover of you, more to desire of you. An authentic relationship can be had with you and that that's what we're seeking. God, we give you all the glory. This is all possible because of the work you completed first on the cross, the work of salvation and grace that has come to each of us, that gives us strength, an accomplishment more than we could ever ask or imagine, but because of you. It's in the name of Jesus, that holy name, that amazing name, the name we lift up. It's in the, that name we say, amen. Amen. Right now, I want to encourage you. If you're online, our prayer team can meet you digitally, but if you're in the room right now, our prayer team's going to come up front, and maybe the first way that you start to really discover this is by actually maybe just praying with someone else praying with one of our prayer partners where, where they can help you through that, where it's a, a desire that happens on the inside first. That for each of us, we're gonna be a church that seek God first here before we go anywhere else. Church, I love you. Next week is gonna be an amazing Sunday. I can't wait to see you then. Have a great week.